Luke 14, 14, the Bible says, For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So just, a, just as a title for this morning or this afternoon now, it's he that humbleth himself. He that humbleth himself. All right? God wants us to be people of humility. In fact, in order for you to be saved, the first thing you need to do is be humble. To put your hand up and say, hey, I can't save myself. Hey, I come short of the glory of God. I come short of His commandments. I'm a sinner. And it's when you get to that point, that's when you, bring humil- you show humility, right, toward God. And that's when you can yell out and say, Lord, please save me. I need a Savior. So let's look at this. Let's look at uh, verse number 1, Luke 14, verse 1. So we're going to see a story play out here where Jesus Christ again heals on the Sabbath day. We saw the same thing happen in chapter 13. But what we saw happen in chapter 13 was in a synagogue. This time it takes place in a chief Pharisee's house. Look at this in verse number 1. It says, And it came to pass as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day. And they watched him. Okay? Do you think these Pharisees that had you know, invited Christ into the house... Do you think they're just watching him because they really want to learn his wisdom? They want to see what he's teaching? No, they invite him to his house because they want to catch him out. They invite him into the house because they want to see what, you know, what can we accuse Jesus of? And you see this in verse number two. Look at this. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. Okay? Now remember, this is the chief Pharisee's house. So he's invited, he's bidden people to come in and participate of the supper that he's got on. And for whatever reason, he invites this man with a dropsy. Now, I looked up what this was. Okay, it's, it's an archaic word for a condition where it's kind of like fluid retention in the body. Okay, and you get puffy skin, and it's a very painful, uh, it's, it's, it's a very painful condition. Okay, so this fluid retention, puffiness, painfulness, and they, they have him there with Jesus Christ, and they watch him. Okay, because they already experience, they already know what happened in the previous chapter. They know that Jesus Christ would heal on the Sabbath day, and it's, it's, it's as if they're just watching him to see what he's going to do. You know, it, it, it's, you can clearly see that they're trying to set a trap for Jesus Christ. Okay, verse number three. And Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? So, is it right? Is it against the law? Verse four, and they held their peace. And he took him and healed him and let him go. Why do you think they held their peace? If you remember the previous chapter, it's because Jesus Christ showed them for their hypocrisy. And if you remember what it said, that they were ashamed. They were ashamed that they were people that would take their, their animals you know, uh, uh, to, to get a drink of water, but they would not care enough to help heal a fellow human man. Okay? And you see they hold their peace with Jesus Christ. Okay? Do you think this is a hard question to answer? Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? No, they don't speak because they don't want to be seen as the hypocrites that they are. But we see Jesus Christ, he's got no problem, the God, the creator of all things, to heal on the Sabbath day. Okay? There's no problem to help your fellow man on the Sabbath day. There's nothing wrong with going and preaching the gospel on the Sabbath day. Okay? It's perfectly fine. The Sabbath is for the man. Let's keep reading verse number 5. And answered them, saying, so now he asks another question, which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? So he says, look, if you have an animal that falls into a pit, which of you would not pull, try to help that animal out? Do you think they're going to answer him? Verse number six, and they could not answer him again to these things. Look, is Jesus asking a hard question? Common sense, Right? You have, if you have a pet, it's got stuck somewhere on a Sabbath day, oh, we can't work. No, of course you go and help that animal. Of course you go helping that creature, okay? Jesus is asking common sense questions. Hey, here's another red flag for the false prophets. If you ask them basic questions and they don't answer it. You know, they skip away, they turn to another topic. You know, you ask one of these preachers, don't you believe salvation is by believing on Jesus Christ alone? And then they go off on some other tangent, or they don't answer it. Hey, there's, a red, there's, there's another red flag of a false prophet. Okay, when it comes to simple, straightforward, common sense questions, you know, any man of God, any preacher should be able to give, you know, a, a good answer to that. 
Now, you know, of course, you know, some questions come up. They're complicated. You know, um, you know it, it requires a deep understanding of scriptures. Whatever. Sometimes you may need time to think about it. But you don't need time to think about whether you're going to help your animal out. Okay? You're not going to have to take time where you think, you know, can I heal this person? Can I help this person? No. You know, common sense, you know, the natural love that you should have for a human being will dictate you. If I can help that person, I will go and help them. Okay? Verse number seven. And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden. Okay? So this just shows you that this supper that was being had or this invitation to eat bread were, was by invitation. Okay? Because it says to those that were bidden. So that were, that were asked to come. They were invited to come to participate. This wasn't some public thing. That's why I believe they were trying to catch Jesus out. They brought that, that sick man along as well. All right? And it says, when he marked or he, he, he observed and saw how they chose out the chief rooms, okay, saying unto them, when thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest the more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee, and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin and with sorry, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. So we have Jesus just observing these lawyers, just observing these Pharisees, and he sees that they're trying to pick out the chief rooms. They're trying to pick out the best place for them to sit. Okay? Where can I be seen of men? You know, where can I sit? So it looks like, you know, I'm I'm someone of a high social class, I have high importance. And Jesus observes that and watches that. And then he gives this parable of the wedding day. All right? It's kind of like the wedding reception. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe the wedding ceremony, we don't do it so much. But generally speaking, even with a wedding ceremony, you still would leave the front seats normally for, you know, for the page boy, you know, for the parents of the groom, you know, for a family that may have traveled a long distance. You know, usually that's reserved for that. So that's like coming into a wedding where you've been invited as a guest. You know, you're just a friend of the of the bridal party and you just rock up and take up the top the best seat you know but because that might be reserved for someone more important you know that person is asked now you've got to go sit somewhere else you know and and that's 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 embar- that's embarrassing right to be embarrassed to do that you know just flying on the, on the plane sometimes i see this quite often now that i fly every week you know sometimes you see people seated on the wrong seats you know and then you see other passengers walk up and go hold on oh, that's my seat and then for a minute they're both like no you you know that one's wrong no you're wrong and then the air hostess comes up, checks the tickets, goes, no, you actually have to move over there. And it's embarrassing because, like, you know, in a plane, you're in a little thing and everyone's, like, talking and everyone's, like, watching what's going on, you know. So you've got to get up in your seat and go sit where you've got to sit. It's embarrassing, right? So Jesus is basically teaching about humility, you know. It's better to take the lowest seat first, okay. It's better to be humble and then to be brought forward, then to be exalted, than it is to exalt yourself and then be made to, uh, to eat humble pie, Okay, look at verse number 10. Uh, But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room. And when he bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, friend, go up higher. Then shall thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with with thee. So look, this is a good principle for us. You know, be, take the place of humility first. Even if you think you might be upgraded, Look, just take the lower seats first. Okay, I'm not talking about just a wedding. I'm talking about in life in general. Okay, you know, if, if you're someone that, you know, you're, 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 you know, you're in employment, you know, you're working, you know, you're working hard, you know, you don't need to be someone that toots their own horn and say, look how, look how great I am, look how much I've achieved. You know, I was often rebuked by my manager and says, you know, Kevin, you've got to promote yourself. You know, you're doing all this work, you know, but nobody knows. You've got to promote, you've got to tell people you're doing this. And I'm like, why? God knows. You know, God knows I'm working hard. And if I read my Bible, here's the one that exalts. Here's the one that promotes. I'll leave it in God's hand. And if, if I don't get promoted, I'll, it was, it's not worthy to be promoted yet. You know, it might come later in life, you know. And I'm telling you, everywhere I've worked, I've been promoted pretty quickly. Okay, because I toot my own horn and let people know. Of course not. I just wait for the Lord to set things in order, you know, and you get promoted, you know, becoming a pastor. You know, I, my, my, my pastors at, at one of my old churches, they wanted to ordain me, they wanted to send me out, but because of the end times, you know, because of the rapture, post trip rapture, they wouldn't do it, you know. So I had a couple of people in my church say, why don't you just go out and start your own church? Why? Why would I do such a thing? 
Why would I do something against the Lord God? You know, pastors ordain pastors, churches beget churches. Okay, that's what we see in the Bible. And so look, if that's not my time to be promoted, I'm not going to force it. I'm not going to force the issue. You know, I just prayed to the Lord. He opened up another door and I went through that process. Okay, it took me longer than I thought, but whatever. You know, I went according to the way God has asked. It's such an important thing, not just in life, but especially in the church. Okay, and one thing I just want to make very clear is that when I'm preaching behind the pulpit, I, I, I've said this before, I'm not someone here. It, look, my, my, my office gives me authority in the church. My office of the bishop, the office of being a pastor, that's what gives me authority. But me standing behind this pulpit is me taking a position of servitude. Okay, It's a position of humility. I'm coming, preparing a sermon, and I'm offering you a meal. Okay, That's how I am, I, like a waiter. You know, I, I, I get the food, and I come and offer that meal to you. I'm serving you when I'm behind this pulpit. And unfortunately, a lot of people make the wrong mistake. They think, well, if I'm standing behind the pulpit, I must have authority. No. Okay? There's two officers in a church, the office of a bishop, the office of a deacon, and it's these people that have some level of authority within the church. Okay? When I ask you to come up here and preach behind the pulpit, you're not taking a position of authority. And I think you all know that anyway, whoever preaches that, okay? And right now, I'm not taking a position of authority. Right now, I'm just teaching the Word of God. I'm being a humble servant as much as I can and doing the best job that I can, okay? But unfortunately, like I said, time and time again, and we've just seen a recent example of this, you know, just because I've been preaching, I must have, you know, some, I must hold some level of authority. I must have be some sort of leader. No, okay? It's, it doesn't work that way, all right? I mean, Paul, think of the Apostle Paul. Of course, it was his office of being the Apostle, but he wasn't there in every church preaching day in, day out, okay? He'd go and travel around, yet he held his, his a position of authority because of his office, the office of an apostle, all right? So just keep that in mind in context of a church, okay? Just because someone preaches behind the pulpit does not mean they have any authority in the church, all right? Now, let's uh, look at uh, verse number 11. Oh, by the way, I just want to clarify something in verse number 10. It says, you know, sit, it says uh, uh, at the end of it, it says, then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them. Of course, we know we shouldn't worship men, okay? But the, whole, the idea of, of worship there is basically, you know, you'd be, you, you, you're given honor. You're being given glory when you're asked to be, you know, moved into a, a more prominent position. That's what that idea of the worship means there. Verse number 11. And this is a verse that we should live by, you know? Did, did I ask you, if I didn't ask you guys to memorize this verse, please memorize it, Okay? For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased. It's not they might be. It says they shall be abased. Okay? Anyone that exalts themselves will be brought down low by God. Okay? It will happen. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Okay? If you want God to exalt you, if you want God to give you that honor, a position of, of, uh, of, of honor, you've got to first humble yourself. Okay? And that's hard because we have the flesh, we have pride. You know, man generally wants to uh, be, be uh, acknowledged. Man, you know, generally wants to uh, be seen well of men. You know, they, they generally want to have, you know, good words to say. Sometimes when I preach, you guys say to me, oh, that was a good sermon, you know? And then there's a war in my, in my, my flesh. There's a war. It's got, my flesh goes, oh, man, you're a good preacher. And then my, my spirit is like, no, 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 you're preaching the word of God. It's, it's God's word, right? Whenever that happens, it's like this war in my body. It's like, whoa, hold on, hold on, what's going on, right? Because look, we all have that flesh. We can all fall into pride. Pride is one of these sins. It's so secretive. You may not even realize, you know, that you're being prideful, okay? Until you fall many times, okay? But um, I just want to quickly uh, quote to you First Peter chapter 5, verse 5. You don't need to turn there. But this is in the context of a church. It says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Okay, so in a church environment, the younger needs to submit themselves to the elder, or to the pastor. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. What does due time mean? In God's time, okay? 
I didn't have to go and just start my own church and just be a rebellious person. No. God had his time. God had his due time where I would be ordained and able to start, start, start this church. But look, in the context of this church, you know, I have authority over you. While we gather together as a church, okay, and the instruction is that you would submit to the elder, okay, submit to the pastor. And I appreciate that. I'll give you one quick example of this where I won't say who it was, but one of the men was getting prepared to preach a sermon, you know, and um, he had a, a position which was slightly different from mine, you know, and he asked me, you know, should I preach this? Can I preach this? At first I said yes, then I thought about it a little bit and I came across some passages and I thought, no, you know what, please don't preach that, you know. And what did he do? He said, all right, no worries, you know. And he submitted himself to the elder, submitted himself to the pastor. Okay, I, I appreciate that. You know, I appreciate that, that it wasn't some issue of contention, you know, oh, hold on, why don't you believe it just like the way I do? No, you know what, that showed humility. You know, and the Bible says there that humble yourselves before, un, you know, therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. I mean, how many promotions of God have we maybe missed out on because we've promoted ourselves, because we've exalted ourselves? I mean, we don't know. We don't know how much promotion we've missed out on, okay, because of pride, because of exaltation. So it's a, it's a you know, I, I love it. I, I love seeing that, not because, you know, it makes me feel good. I love seeing it because I can see that people generally love the Lord. You know, they love this church and they want it to function. They want it to work as biblical as possible. And I'm really thankful for the, for the people that we have in this church. I'm really thankful for what God has given us. And I'll just read to you quickly from Proverbs 15, verse 33. It says, The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Before honor is humility. God will only ever honor you if you first humble yourself before Him. Okay? That means you have to humble your will to God's will in your life, all right? Then God can work in you, God can lift you up, God can exalt you and make you a, a, a greater Christian than what you already are. Back in Luke 14, verse 12, Luke 14, verse 12. Then said he also to him that bade him. So now he's talking to the one that invited him. When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. Now this is, this is a hard, this is a hard saying. Okay? When Jesus Christ came on the scene, not only did he reinforce the Old Testament laws, but he lifted up the bar. Okay? He lifted it up. And this is what he says. Verse number 13. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Okay? So, wow. You know, basically Jesus Christ, in a sense, is rebuking the man that invited him to the supper. You know, you've invited all these dignitaries and you've invited these, you know, chief rulers and these lawyers, you know. But he goes, look, you're not going to be rewarded for that. You're not going to be rewarded for that because they're going to come back and recompense what you've done for them. They're going to invite you. They're going to, you know, shower you with gifts and with honor and all those kind of stuff. And it's the same teaching that we've heard, you know, before. Is that, you know, if, if you're trying to, you know, if you're, you're at church and you're, and you're serving in the church, but you do it um, to be a seen of men, then your reward is on this earth. Okay? But if you do it to be seen of God, then God will reward you in the resurrection of the just. Okay, the rapture. Let me just, I'll just quickly say this. Those that teach that Jesus never taught on the rapture, hey, what nonsense. Right. Right, right here he's talking about the resurrection of the just. What do you think that's about? <laughs> it's the rapture. The rapture is the resurrection, okay? The resurrection of uh, believers. But here's the thing. Are you saying, are you saying Pastor Kevin, are we, am, I, am, I, am I meant to find the scum of the earth right now? You know, the, the, the disabled and the poor and whatever. Bring him into my house and feed him. Is that what Jesus is teaching him? I don't believe that's the primary teaching here. Okay, because Jesus keeps talking, okay? Um, <clears throat> but I think there is a blessing for that. I think you can take the principles and apply it in many ways. Okay, even in a church environment, you know? Um, you know, if you see someone that, you know, comes to church but they don't have any, any friends, you know, you should go out there and make them welcome. 
as, you know, as welcome as you would anyone else. They may not be able to show you any kind of appreciation or anything like that, but you do it and the Lord will reward you at the resurrection. Okay? You, you, um, but we keep reading here, because I believe what Jesus Christ is actually pointing to ultimately is preaching the gospel. Okay? Preaching to the gospel to those that are maimed, to those that are lame and blind. Because we keep reading. Look at verse 15. <clears throat> Remember, Jesus just finished talking about the resurrection of the just. But then in verse 15, And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. So this man that responds to Jesus after talking about the resurrection of the just recognizes that the resurrection has something to do with the kingdom of God, has something to do with eating bread in the kingdom of God, you know. And uh, this man is not even saved, okay. This man's not even saved. We'll see it because Jesus responds to him. This man's not even saved. He goes, man, yeah, it's awesome, you know, uh, talking almost about himself, that it's blessed to, to be in the kingdom of God and to eat bread, you know, because he recognizes that Jesus is not just given a, a, uh, a literal lesson here, but actually a spiritual lesson about, uh, you know, the rewards in heaven, the kingdom of God, etc., and look how Jesus responds to him. Verse number 16. Then said he unto him. So Jesus is definitely responding to this man that just said this, okay? He goes, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servants at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke, uh, five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. All right, so we know this is just a story. This is a parable. And if you read it, if you're familiar with it, it's about salvation. It's about the supper of God being, uh, going out and, and people coming in and participating of that supper. Okay, and Jesus gives this illustration here that many were invited, but they were making excuses not to come. Remember, he's responding to the man. He's responding to the man. What do you think he's trying to tell him here? That you've not yet come. You're still making excuses. Okay, you're still making excuses not to come to the supper. You still not yet believed on me. You still not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. fixed okay let's have a look at this <clears throat> so you have people making excuses okay making excuses not to come and I'm, I'm often reminded with um you know we go soul winning okay we go soul winning knock doors you know would you give me a couple of minutes to show you what the bible says about going to heaven ah oh, i've just uh i've got to study for my exam tomorrow you know ah oh, i just married a wife you know no <laughs> or whatever you know oh no i've got uh you know i've got something cooking in the kitchen you know or they make all these excuses not to come, not to come to the supper. It's the same kind of idea here, okay? Verse number 21, verse number 21. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. This is, this is still the story. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, <clears throat> Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. This is the same group of people, the same type of people that were mentioned in the previous one, remember? So I think Jesus now is given the, 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 the spiritual teaching here. What is he trying to teach? Okay? Now the teaching here is basically those that are hungry, those that are needy, those that are without, you know, if they're offered a free supper, they're going to be there. Okay? They have needs, they're going to be there. They're going to be like, yeah, where is it at? At what time? I'm going to be there. Okay? And that's a reality of, of, of salvation. When you go and preach the gospel, where are people more receptive? It's in those lower social economic areas that people are more receptive, isn't it? Okay? Those that, have, that, that are without. And even then, in Australia, those that are without, they're still very rich. Okay? Even then, you know, that's why, you know, if you go to places like third world countries, like the Philippines, or, you know, places in Africa or whatever, you know, people are flocking to hear the gospel. Okay, these are a great example of people that are poor, maimed, halt, and blind. Okay, they've got nothing to live for. They, you know, to, to hear great news about salvation, this free supper they can come to is music to their ears, and they're going to flock to hearing that. So these are the people that God is pointing to. These are the people that are going to come in to the supper. All right. 
Now, does that represent the people that were at, at the supper of Je- that Jesus Christ was in? No. The supper that Jesus Christ was in was all the high and mighty, right? All the Pharisees and the lawyers. And that's why I believe this man that said this to Jesus was not even saved. Because Jesus is giving that illustration. You're like those that ha- are making excuses, okay? That's why we need to go to the poor, maimed, halt, and the blind. All right? Verse 22. <clears throat> and the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded. I love it. The Lord said, go and do it. Go invite these people. What does he say? It is done as thou hast commanded. That's what we need to say. Okay? When we go out, we, we preach this, the gospel, guys. We go out and do the works of God. I want us to just with a clean heart say to God, it is done as thou hast commanded. What a shame if we're a church that God commands us to do his work and we don't do it. Say, well, Lord, I didn't do what you commanded. You know, no, we need to be a church that says it is done as thou hast commanded. And look what he says. And yet there is room. He says, look, there's, we have more space. We can bring in more people. You know, if, if we end up knocking all of the Sunshine Coast, do we, all right, done, we, fit, we accomplish our task. No, we should be the same. And yet there is more room. That's what we should be saying. Hey, let's do it again. Let's go out there, invite people. Let's, let's, let's try again. Let, let's uh, go and, 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 and water what we've planted. Let's go and reap the harvest of what we started with. It's a great uh, attitude that this servant had to the Lord. And then in verse 23, it says, And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Hey, that house will not be filled until God creates his new heavens and the new earth. Okay, we we can continue filling that house until that happens. I've been given that great honor to continue doing that, okay? And notice that it says, compel them to come in. What does it mean to compel? It means to encourage, all right, to Apply some pressure, okay? I'm not saying, like, okay, man, all right, you know, one, two, three, repeat after me. Come on, this is going to get you saved. Say it. You know, that, no. You know, they've got to believe the gospel, right? They've got to believe the gospel. But, you know, it, there's nothing wrong with you saying to someone, look, you know, they're like, oh, you know, I need some time to think about it. You know, it's like, look, you may never hear this again. I'm passing through. You may never see me again in your life. You may never hear it ever again. Today is the day of salvation. Why don't you place your faith on Jesus Christ right now? Nothing wrong with that. That's compelling people to come in. That's showing them that it's important. Hey, you know, and sometimes I say this. I said, look, I don't know when I'm going to die. You know, I might be talking to you now. I'm driving back home afterwards. I have a car accident. That's the end of me. You know, we don't know when our lives are going to end. Why don't you receive Christ right now? That's compelling them to come in, right? You, I mean, you can't force someone to believe, okay? You can't force them to believe. But what you can do is show them the seriousness of the position they're in and, and the need for a savior, you know, and there's nothing to lose. It's a free gift, you know. It's fine to compel them to come in, all right? None of this one, two, three, repeat after me business now, okay? Verse 24, verse 24. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. All right, so again, this is why I don't believe this man was saved, okay? Because Jesus says none of those men which were bidden that were first invited shall taste of my supper. Those that made excuses, I can't be there for whatever reason. Remember, remember who he's talking to, you know, the top of the, the, be, you know, the best, you know, the high ranked people, you know, Jesus Christ saying, no, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the blind, it's the maimed, they're the ones that are going to come in, they're the ones that are going to participate of that supper, okay, and, uh, uh, and notice that he also says this in verse 24, this is very, I was going to say brave, but can God be brave, I'm not sure, but look, it says, for I say unto you that none of those men which are bidden shall taste of my supper. What was this man talking about? The kingdom of God. Blessed is he that eats bread in the kingdom of God. Jesus says, hey, that's my supper. What's he saying? I'm God. Okay, that's my kingdom. I'm the king of kings. I'm the Lord of lords. You know, participate of my supper. Okay, because this is your chance. I'm here right now. You know, if you keep making excuses and you don't receive me, you're not going to taste of his supper. You know, uh, what, what a great thing, you know. Those that reject Christ, those that reject Him will not enter into the kingdom of God. Will not, okay? Now, look, your sin, your sin does not send you to hell, okay? Your sin 
makes you deserving of hell. What sends you to hell is if you do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. What sends you to hell is if you reject the Lord of the Supper. Okay, That is ultimately what sends you to hell. But it's your sins that made you first deserving of going to hell. Okay, The reason I say that, you know, um, your sin does not send you to hell is because we all have sin. Okay, We all have sin. And we know that if you're saved, I'm not going to be sent to hell. Even though I'm deserving of going to hell, I'm, I know I'm not going to hell because I've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why I know. Okay, So, just because you believed on Christ doesn't mean you're any less uh, not deserving of going. You are still deserving. That's why it's called grace. That's why God has given us His grace because grace is something that is unmerited. Grace is something that is not deserving of God, by God. Okay, We don't deserve His grace. We don't deserve His salvation. We don't deserve this supper. You know, we're like that, those lame and, and the maimed and, and uh, the blind, you know. But yet God, you know, sought, uh, sought, sought out someone to give us the gospel, you know, whether face to face or via some video or something. And we heard the invitation to the supper. We've said, yes, I'm going to that supper. Yes, I need that salvation. Okay. So if you've been saved, you will eat bread. You, what, what a blessing to eat bread in the kingdom of God. All right. Um, sorry, what am I up to, guys? Do you know? Verse 25, I think. 25. Verse 25. Okay. Verse 25 takes... Uh, something changes here. Because it says, And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them. So you can see he's no longer in this Pharisee's house. He's gone off, and a great multitude are with him. A, a great multitude are following him. Okay? So what does he say unto them? Verse 26. If any man come to me and hate not his own father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So we've touched on this a little bit. I've touched on this. Uh, Brother Callum touched on this not long ago as well. But always keep in mind, when Jesus Christ says these things, okay, the primary application was to those that were literally following Christ. Okay? The multitudes that are literally, at that time, when Jesus Christ was on the earth, were literally following after him. Okay? They wanted to hear more, they wanted to know more. And Jesus Christ just, just gives them the reality of it. Okay? You've got to hate your father, your mother, your wife, and your children, your brethren, your sisters, and your own life, otherwise you cannot be my disciple. You know, Jesus says, look, if you want to follow me, you know, if you want to you come after me, these, these years that I'm here serving this ministry, you've got to give it all up, okay? Because if you don't come now, I'm going to be long gone. I'm going to be long gone. You won't find me again, okay? Now, this is not salvation. We know that salvation is not discipleship, okay? You giving up everything to follow after Jesus does not save anybody, okay? Again, we've said this before. Judas Iscariot gave up everything, made himself a disciple, and followed after Jesus. Was he saved? No, he's burning in hell right now. Okay? So this is just the reality of if you wanted to be a disciple of Jesus in that time, you had to bear up, take up your cross, follow after him. Otherwise, you could not be that disciple. But of course, we can take a secondary application for us. Okay? Just because it's not directly for us doesn't mean we can't take the lessons, the applications, and apply that to our lives. You know, one thing I'm reminded when I, when I read this passage, and if I use this illustration before, forgive me, but I used to work with a, with a Muslim man. Okay, and uh, we would talk about the Bible, we would talk about the gospel, and I would share the gospel with him. He had asked a lot of questions, and I, I got to a point where I was just getting frustrated. He kept asking me, it's like, just leave me alone. But he got to a point where he said to me, out of all the ways to heaven that I've, that I, that I've heard, what you've explained to me makes the most sense. Okay, it makes the most sense. I realize that we cannot earn our way to heaven. I realize that Jesus Christ took on the sins of the whole world, and I'd love to believe it, he said to me. But if I believe it, he said to me, then I have to accept that my mum and dad are on their way to hell. And because of that, I can't believe it. Okay? Because of that, I can't believe it. So what is he putting first in his life? Was he putting Jesus Christ first, his own salvation, or was he putting his parents first in that example? His parents first, right? He, he couldn't accept. He knew what I was saying was true. 
But he couldn't accept that that means mom and dad. Mom and dad, they're not going to hear what I have to say. They're going to reject this. And because they're going to reject it, then I'm going to reject it. Hey, listen to me. God comes first. Okay? God comes first before our mothers, before our fathers, before our wives, before our husbands, before our children, before our workplace. God comes first before this church. God comes first before the government. God comes first in our lives. He has to take priority. Okay, He has the preeminence. I promise you this. You put God first in your life and everything else in your life is going to get fixed. You know, quite often we think, man, I've got this problem. I need to take time to fix this, this issue in my, my family or in my workplace. Or in, uh, I don't have time to read the Bible. I haven't got time to pray. I haven't got time to go to church because I've got to sort out all these other issues. Listen, put God first, okay, and he'll sort it out for you, okay? God wants, 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 uh, wants your worship. He wants your time, okay? He wants you in church. He wants you reading the Bible. He wants you fellowshipping with him and praying with him first. Don't you think if you put him first, he's going to take care of your little things that you deal with? And they are little things in comparison to, you know, some of the, some of the you know, problems other people go through. It is little in comparison to people going to hell, and spending, you know, eternity in the lake of fire, okay? Look, we need to put God first in our lives. We cannot allow other people to prevent, stop that, okay? And I, I, I'm saddened, I'm, I'm saddened, because I, I get emailed by people, I get phone calls by people. And, you know, sometimes I, I get from, like, usually I talk to men, I don't talk to ladies, you know, on the phone, but, you know, it's like, I want to serve the Lord, I want to do this, I want to pursue it, but my wife's not on board, you know, and, and, and in my, my, you know, I'm trying to, to follow after him, but it's causing strain in our marriage. It's causing problems in our marriage. You know, what do I do? It's very hard. You know, how do you, you, know, how do you, how do you provide, you know, um, counsel for that kind of situation? Because you know they need to put God first, okay? But if they had good leadership, then their wife would be along the way. Their wife would be coming along and, um, you know, not causing, you know, turmoils in their family or whatever. But you know, so, you know what? We need to make sure he comes first, okay? We need to make sure God comes first in our lives. Verse 28, verse 28. And which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. And I touched upon this last week, right? We've laid a foundation for New Life Baptist Church. You know, I want to keep building. I want to keep building, guys. I want to push forward, but we need to make sure we check the integrity. We've got to, we've got to give ourselves a bit of a shake, right? And whatever's creaky, whatever's not solid, we need to fix that before we continue building, okay? But we need to make sure that we count the cost. You know what? To be faithful, strong believers, serving God, doing great things for God, it's going to cost us something. And we need to make sure that we're able to afford it, okay? We need to make sure that we're able to finish the work that God has given us to do. Okay, I was very, you know, with the building, just, just, just a, you know, a very practical thing. I was a little concerned, can we afford it? Thank God, we've been able to do that, right? But how embarrassing would it be if I signed a six-month lease and then like two months into it, oh, we can't afford the building. Now we're stuck with this lease. You know, we, we can't finish what we had started. Now, thank God that, you know, that's one area that we are completing. You know, we are finishing what God has given us. But also, you know, our own spiritual lives. You know, keep your finger there. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. And men, sometimes we're like this. We start projects and we don't finish it. Okay? And, and they're sort of halfway done. Then we start another project and we don't finish it. And then our wives come up. Can I chuck this in the bin? You know, can we get rid of this? Why haven't you finished it? You know, hey, you know, we should finish what we started. But in your own spiritual life, look at Hebrews 12, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. It says, Looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hey, you want to finish what you started? You've been saved? You got excited? You want to grow in the Lord? You want to serve more days of your life? 
You're going to have to set your eyes on Jesus Christ. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Okay? It's not Pastor Kevin Sepulveda that you set your eyes on. Okay? It's not some other pastor in America that you set your hearts on and your eyes upon. Okay? They're not the, the author and the finisher of your faith. Yeah, people can help you along. Having good examples can help you along. Can, uh, can, you know, people they can turn to and ask questions. That's fine. Okay? But as we've seen, pastors can fail. Okay, as we've seen, you know, people get hurt when, when men of God fail. But if your eyes are set on Jesus Christ, He will make sure your faith is finished. He'll make sure that you see it through. But your eyes have to be on Jesus. You know, sometimes we get saved. Like, great, yeah, I've learned so much. But then we try to finish it in our own strength. No. You know what? No, it's Jesus Christ. We've got to be more like Him. We need to be growing in the faith. Okay, growing every year, 2020, we should be more mature, we should be more godly, we should be more holy than we were in 2019, than we were in 2018. We need to continue on that course, okay? Because if we give up, if we just go stale, we start going backwards, that's when we're going to fail, that's when we're going to fall in temptations and all, all kinds of manner of sins. And yeah, we'll be ashamed because we didn't finish what we had builded. Go back to Luke chapter... 14 verse 31 Luke chapter 14 verse 31 <clears throat> or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000 or else while the other is yet a great way off he sendeth an ambassage and desire of conditions of peace. So look, if you're a king and you're being attacked by an enemy of 20,000 and all you've got is a troop of 10,000, you've got half the army, you need to first consider, can I win this war with 10,000? Now let me just say this very quickly. Yes, you can. Okay? You know, yes, you can win that war even with us. I mean, look, the, the Bible is full. The Bible is full of stories of the underdog winning, right? The, the most popular one being, you know, David and Goliath. But the Bible's full of stories like that, you know? When the people of God had great victories, even though there was few, okay? And this church right now, we are few, okay? We are few. But does that mean we can't have the great victories? Of course we can. But before we go into the battle, we need to make sure, can we win that fight, okay? I don't want to put ourselves in a position Fight some battle that's going to destroy our church. Okay, we need to be careful about that. Because if it's going to destroy our church, then it would have been better to just have made peace, like you said there in verse uh, 32, right? Just just go send an ambassador and say, hey, let, let's just not fight. Let's sort this out amongst ourselves, you know, and, um, and sort things out that way. But look, Christianity is a battle, okay? We heard today about contending for the faith, Okay? It's not something that we should just be relaxed and sit back. No, we need to be fighting for the doctrines that God has given us. We need to be fighting for the souls of men in this area. We need to be mindful. We can't just fight everyone in every battle. We need to be careful as to what battles we fight. And the battles we choose to fight, we better make sure we win them. And yes, we can win them even with you. Okay, because we're on the Lord's side. Okay, and if the Lord is fighting our battle, you know, who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? Chapter, verse 33, verse 33. So likewise, by the way, let me just, before I read that, you know, just what's happening in America is just on my mind, you know. Because do you think a man just, you know, sleeps with prostitutes, I, I just fell into sin? Of course not. You know where that started? On his computer. You know, I have no doubt, on his phone looking at pornography, no doubt, okay? And listen, if you can't win the battle with your computer, if you can't win the battle with your iPhone or your iPad, then just get rid of it, throw it out, okay? If there's pornography on your computer, just take that rubbish and throw it in the bin. Go get a baseball bat and just smash that thing. Get rid of it, okay? Can you fight the battle or not, okay? We can win it. We can fight those battles. Okay? It can be done. But if you're losing and you've lost, get rid of it. 
Okay? Wait, wait for the Lord to exalt you. You know, humble yourself before God. You know, seek Him. You know, put Him first in your life. And then maybe then the Lord will give the strength and the experience and the patience and everything else that goes with it to be able to fight those wars in the, in the future. Okay? Please be careful. We see great men of God failing. Okay? We can fail too. You know? It's easy to look at other people and say, oh, look at them. Hey, it can happen to us. Okay? Make sure, look, if you're losing battles in your life, get rid of it. Okay? Get rid of it. Verse 33. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Salt is good. By the way, I like salt in my food. Okay? And uh, if you're going to make me a meal, <laughs> put a bit of salt. Jesus said salt is good. <laughs> all right? I'm with Jesus on this one. All right? You have all the dietitians and the doctors saying, don't put salt in your food, it's going to kill you, whatever. I'm with Jesus. All right? Salt is good. Anyway, side point. <laughs> but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land, not yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, when I was reading this, again, you know, when you don't really study the Bible, just read. You read things and you sort of gloss over it. But have you ever wondered what it said there in verse 35? It, um, it is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill. You know, and so I looked this up, you know. What does salt have to do with manure, you know, or the dunghill? Well, apparently, I didn't know this, but apparently salt can enrich manure. Okay, it can actually make it more effective. Um, and it also has an, um, it can also mask the smell a little bit as well. Okay, it has those properties of masking the manure smell, but also to make it more rich so the plants can, uh, can uh, um, you know, grow out of it. Okay, but first of all, salt is used for savor, okay, to season food, you know, and we ought to be people that are salty, people that stand up, people that, that have flavor, you know, I don't want to be like, again, I think, did we talk about it last week? I'm getting confused now, you know, about being some stale Christian, no, we need to be Christians that are salty, that stand out. People go, man, you taste different. Okay? You, you, you've got something different about you. That's how we ought to be. But if we've lost our savor, you know, if we're not living for, the, for Christ, we're just like the world. If we lose it, we're not even fit for the dung hill. We're not even fit for the manure. So how bad then are you as a Christian if you're not even good enough for manure? All right? You're worse than that. And that's why it says it's, it's cast out, you know, and, um, but men cast it out. He that hath ears, let him hear. Jesus wants us to hear this. Okay? This is a truth that is not being preached in churches. Okay? That a Christian can become stale. That a Christian can lose their savor. They can lose their light. And God has no more use for that person. It can, it's true. You know, the Bible teaches these things. It's not about losing your salvation. I'm just saying you can, you get to a point where you're no longer effective for God. You're no longer effective for Him because you've not put Christ first in your life. Okay, you've put other things in your life, you're pursuing the world, and God's like, you know what? This person can't be used anymore. You know, God might wipe you out. Might happen. Or He just might let you see it through, whatever. You know, it's, it's, it's down to you know, God's point at that point, you know, at, at that stage. But that's a sad thing because Jesus Christ is saying here, you know, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. You know, it's a, it's a reality. You've been to churches. You've seen those stale Christians. You've seen those people that don't care about serving the Lord. Okay? I would hate if we become people like that. Okay? I would hate it. So, uh, that's what I've got for you today, guys. Um, just remember, be humble. Okay? We all have the flesh. We all have pride. You know? We all want to kind of be seen of men a little bit. You know, it's, it's in us. You say, no, no, not me. I, I'm a very humble person. Yeah, that's pride speaking. <laughs> we all have it in us, okay? Let's be mindful. Know that God is watching us. Be the husbands we need to be, the wives we need to be, the church members that we need to be, the employees we need to do. Just work hard, right? And know that God is watching us. Serve the Lord and wait for Him to promote you. Wait for Him to exalt you all in due time, in His timing. Let's pray.